Hi everyone, welcome back to Kingdom of Loathing. Um, I'm here right after Lady Spooky Raven's shenanigans. Uh, we now have Fernsworthy's Tower and the Fun House. So, I mean, we already had the Fun House. But now that I actually know what to do here, eventually, I will. Okay, cool. So these uh, balloons can actually make things. Balloon sword. Nice. So these balloons can all make different things. So we're going to lose a lot of power here, but that's okay because we'll be over leveled anyway. Never fumble. Weapon damage minus two and 50% clowny. So with all of these, 25% clowny, 25% clowny, 25%. We're like 125% clowny, which is pretty radical. That means that we can finally get this part of the quest over. Back to the funhouse. Because yeah, we have already been here, so I'm just going to blow through this until I get the encounter that I need. Any second now, I'm sure. Here we go. Push the nose. The clown's eyes pop open and glow with a malevolent red light as they look you up and down. After a moment, the eyes close again, and you sigh with relief as the door slowly swings open with a tortured squeak. Open the door. You're fighting the clown lord, Beelzebozo. Beelzebonzo, clown prince of darkness, smiles evilly from you, evilly at you from atop his throne of human funny bones. Welcome to my lair, adventurer. Your disguise may have fooled my security system, but it does not fool me. You will not leave this place alive. Do you have any witty last words? Screw you, clown, you reply wittily. I'm going to infect him with diseases. You give your opponent the disease. Your opponent lapses into a brief coughing fit. He dumps a bucket of water over you, but fortunately it's just confetti. So you're going to be picking that stuff out of your hair for days. What happens if I inject him? Oh, we killed him. We got distilled seal blood. Look at that. All right, let's head on back. We'll come back to you later. All right. How about you, Gregner? You've done it. You've recovered the vial of ancient seal blood. Your task is nearly complete, Dusky Alfred, at least insofar as restoring the legendary epic weapon is concerned. Now you only need a meatsmithing hammer from the meatsmith here in town and pound the distilled seal's blood back into Bjorn's hammer. This should cover the cost of supplies. Move quickly and return here when you've done this. Uh, while I'm here, I'm going to uh, grab one of these. Rage of the Reindeer. Let's see what that does. Rage of the Rage of the Rage of the Reindeer. Where is it? Here we go. Skills. Uh, this skill fills you with a rage of thousands of subjugated reindeer. This rage will make you stronger, especially when fighting guys with beards. You think about Crimbo and it fills you with rage. Crimbo is the Christmas, by the way. Weapon damage plus 10 and muscle plus 10%. What? 10%? Whoa! That's bananas. All right. Let's head over to Market Square and go to the Meatsmith. And then we'll get a Meatsmithing Hammer. All right. Craft stuff. Now let's combine Ancient Seal Blood. Wait. Smith stuff, right? Bjorn's hammer. Distilled seal blood? Is that it? You create the hammer of smiting. Ooh. I feel the power. And while I'm here, can I make anything? Grapefruit and... Gin? Yeah, salty dog. Cool. Um, is there anything else I can do? Cranberries? No. What do cranberries make? Well, actually, while I'm here, I can combine these. Skuru Duraiba. God, I can't remember any of these. Anyway, let's go to my, let's go to my stuff. All right, it's 9 to 18 damage, muscle plus 16, and a 7% chance of critical hit. Whoa. 
compared to 9 to 17. 5 to 30. Ah, well, this is better. <laughs> uh, I should have done that better, and then it would have been... Uh, would have made my uh well it would have made my severed flipper certainly better by comparison but that's okay let's take it back well success well done the power of the hammer is smiting you'll be a force to be reckoned with even against your nemesis custom it accustom yourself to its use we'll attempt to locate your nemesis in the meantime it won't take us very long cool i just gotta wait See what's in here. Yada 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 yada. Received a message from the distant land. It seemed your father, the renowned archaeologist, had gone missing. His life's work was attracted in an ancient relic known as the Holy MacGuffin. <laughs> he uh, he left behind his diary with instructions to be delivered to you, but he didn't have any funds to pay for shipping, so you have to go pick it up yourself. You can travel there from the travel agency at the store, but there's a hitch. You're going to need a passport for entry, and our offices are closed due to a photograph shortage. You'll need to acquire some forged identification documents from the black market, but we're not sure where it is. It's probably near the Black Forest, so we'll mark that on your map. Once you have the diary, use his notes to track down the Holy MacGuffin. An item of such power will be in great help against the naughty sorceress and other evils that plague our land. By the way, we're sick of the disaster. Holes in the sky. Tentacle beast of the town. We're going to do something about this. Just you wait. Um, so I'm still going to... I'm still partying around here. Spunky princess. Bonk. Magitek Mac Mecha Mech. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, now that I'm actually using my MP, I have full reason to use these items. 11 muscularity. 12 muscularity. Yeah, cool. Uh, let's head out of the galley. Cut, cut, for the love of God, cut. <laughs> you sneak down to the galley of the airship and find the entire crew sitting around a table eating dinner. You jump behind some crates before you see them. The scene that unfolds before you is uh, difficult to describe. Members of the crew are talking, but it's not like a uh, normal conversation. It's as though they're reading from a script. No one speaks until the person before them is completely done speaking, even though they're obviously supposed to be interrupting each other. The character's conversation, well, it runs the gamut from needless exposition about the mission they're on to boring stories about the character's past with occasional details into awkward flirting and ham-handed foreshadowing. The main problem with the conversation, though, is its length. It just goes on and on and on. Just as you become convinced the conversation is going to go on forever, the burly sidekick notices you, picks, picks you up, and angrily throws you up the side of the airship. Ow. You try to dust yourself off and remember what you learned from the experience. You have to learn something, right? It couldn't have possibly just been a pointless and interminable waste of time, could it? Could it? <laughs> Wait. I think about that conversation a lot. I don't know what it is. I just think about it all the time. Oh, yeah. I have my crappy armor on. Uh, let's go put my good stuff on. Take this the hell off. Take this off. Take this off. I had this on. I had... I guess I'll put these back on. And then... Um... My shiny ring gave me more stats, so yeah, that's that's pretty good. Cool. Hello there, young adventurer. Back when I was your age, you used to be quite a fisherman. These days, well, what with my arthritis and my gout and this old war injury, well, I don't get out there so much anymore. Maybe you can help me. Lost my favorite boat, you see. J boot, you see. Dropped it off the side of my boat. Time was I just fished until I turned it back up, and let me tell you, it was a hoot, but not anymore. That dang marlin stopped the loss of my strength. Think you could go down there and get it for me? I'd be a buy a just three. If you want to take the your little buddy down there, this will help. If you need to breathe underwater, I've got an old scuba tank we'll depart with. Call it a thousand meat. On the second thought, let's call it a scuba tank and say it costs a thousand meat. Whoa. Oh, so it sucks two adventures from you. Can't go there now. Desmond wouldn't be able to breathe. That's okay. I'll come back here later. Oops. Yeah, because now I'm just running around looking for the... Uh, he holds out his sword and concentrates. Swirling light surrounds him, which begins a minute and a half long light show. 
Just as you're about to fall asleep, the attack finally hits you. Youch! Critical hit. Super spiky hair gel and phonics down. Cargo hold. Penultimate fantasy chest. Nice. Got the Ocarina of Space. Now that I'm actually... Oh, let's go into here. Because I think that... Actually, wait. Oh, this is the first familiar equipment I've gotten. Minus 20 to familiar weight. Let's your familiar breathe underwater. Oh, I don't know how great that is, actually. I'll only put it on if I need it. Miscellaneous. Oh, yeah, I can fight some seals, too. What does this do? Spiky here. Five adventures. Muscle and moxie. Oh, cool. What about this? Stone-faced. Three damage reduction. That's dope. I don't want to use the spoiled mayonnaise. I really don't want to use the spoiled mayonnaise. Oh, cool. We got that out of our inventory. Oh, right. I've completely forgotten about this whole thing. Oh, whoops. Well, hmm, that's embarrassing. Let's rest here. Oh, I didn't read my dream. Damn it. I'm slipping. Excuse me. Uh, let's look at my wounds. Yeah, I could have done that to begin with. Jeez. All right. Now let's go kick some more ass. There we go. Rip, rap, rapidly do. You're fighting your 131st battle on the way from one end of the ship to the other end. When in the air, when the air in front of you ripples and freezes, the enemy tries to attack you, but bounces off some unforeseen obstacle. You wave your weapon in front of you and encounter some sort of invisible force field protecting you, or protecting your enemy, you're not sure which. Get your answer when the enemy is attacked and dragged backwards by the same unseen force, or at least a very familiar unseen force. He flies over the side of the airship and vanishes. You hear a crinkling, rustling sound rush past your ear. It almost sounds like, take this adventure. It shall prove useful in your quest. The battery is gone and everything is returned to normal, relatively speaking. We got the plastic wrap in materia. <laughs> cool. Deliver the... We got an oversized pizza cutter. Oh, man. Hold on. Pizza cutter. 1 to 20. Soil damage 13. Okay. This is not what a... Oh, I haven't read this as well. This is not what a psychopathically violent teenager in a dystopian future might want to use for an oversized pizza, but a device for slicing pizza into wedge-shaped sections. After you use it for that, you can either eat the slices or use them to make a pie chart, which I guess would actually be a pizza chart. The infamous Hammer Bjorn, now bathed in the magically distilled blood of a thousand baby seals, glows with an inner fire berserk rage. You could bust up stuff with real good with this. You can even smith with it if the age hadn't been lost in the in the mist of antiquity. Stupid mists. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Oh, yeah, I found this. I can read this as well. Hilt in the blade, and part of the blade of what used to be a pretty formidable sword. Now it's like a really flat, really sharp club. Cool. White healer. Am I supposed to be... Okay, so I'm here. I'm supposed to be here. Should I speak to the guy on the thing? Crew quarters. Crew quarters. Am I doing something wrong? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I guess I can also go here as well. Let's go to the Twin Peak. Welcome to the Great Overlook Lodge. Hell yeah. I'm uh, actually, this is very apt. Um, I suppose it's only because this thing references every popular media from the past 50 or so years, but I'm actually watching Twin Peaks right now, so this is very apt. I'm also playing Deadly Premonition, which I might replay for an LP at some point. After a long and tiring climb of the snow-covered peak, you find yourself in front of a large, rustic-styled hotel. The path leading to it is thickly blanketed with snow, and apart from an occasional gust of wind, everything's eerily silent. You might assume they'd be closed for the off-season, but thankfully there's a light in the red-curtained lobby window. 
You trudge up the path and push open the door, carefully closing it behind you to keep out the cold. The lobby is spacious and decorated in a native theme. Your eyes take in the large pictographic murals, the silently staring totem poles, and the typically eye-crossing hotel carpet as you approach the front desk. Nobody's there, so you tap the little silver bell. Ding. The sound is practically swallowed by vast empty space. You wait several minutes, rubbing the cold from your arms. Nobody comes... It's only to be expected, you reason. This is definitely their off-season, so there won't be much staff. Perhaps it's just a lone caretaker. There must be somebody here somewhere, so you sit up to look for them. Ooh, wow. I imagine this is also probably going to be a reference to The Shining. Or The Shining, if you prefer. And there you go. Down the hall from the lobby, you find a large, empty ballroom. There's a bar at the other end, where a bartender in a red jacket is calmly polishing a glass, as bartenders do. Evening, Lloyd, you say as you take a seat. A little slow tonight, isn't it? You start to laugh and then stop uneasy. I didn't know his name was Lloyd. Yes, it is, Miss Good Dusty Alfred. Puts down the glass and leans forward. What'll it be? Well, I'm going to be needing a room, but since I'm here, I guess I could use something to warm me up. You reach for your wallet, but find it unexpectedly empty. Say, Lloyd, I seem to be temporarily light. How's my credit in this joint, anyway? Credit's fine, Mr. Dusty Alfred. Something about his sight grin that's a little unnerving. Maybe it's his eyes. Pale, pale blue, with an almost glassy, filmy look to them. He stares at you, unblinking. You shake your head to regain your composure. That's swell. I like you, Lloyd. Always liked you. Best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. <laughs> Lloyd's slight grin doesn't change. Bourbon, sir, he asks. Let me start with a cup of coffee. There's a real chill in the air. How do you take it? Black as midnight on a moonless night. Pretty black. He picks up the glass and starts polishing it again. Regrettably, sir, I'm unable to provide it. You frown, puzzled. Problem, Lloyd. What's the problem, Lloyd? Not here, Mr. Dusky Alfred. Huh? I'm looking right at you. Suppose you're going to tell me you're at my house? You want me to call you? No, Mr. Dusky Alfred, I'm dead. Dead? You try to laugh, but you can't manage more than a weak chuckle. So who killed you? You know that, Mr. Dusky Alfred. You're the hotel's caretaker, after all. What? You search those icy blue eyes looking for the punchline. I'm no caretaker. I'm a special agent with the, uh... You trail off, confused. Suddenly there's a knock at the door. You turn to look at it and back at Lloyd. He's gone. What the heck? You look around, even standing to see if he's ducked behind the bar, but he's vanished into thin air. Knocking grows more insistent. It's more of a pounding now. All right, I'm coming. You cross to the door and pull it open. A very thin woman with long brown hair and the world's most ear-piercing scream clocks you in the head with a baseball bat, and I don't believe that people can see the very bottom of that. Ah, well, that's okay. Everything goes black. After what might be a moment or an eternity, you slowly become aware of a bright light on your face. You open your eyes and squint, and weakly hold up a hand to block the glare. A bald black man in an impeccably clean chef's uniform stands above you. Though it could be your perspective i.e. lying on the floor, he appears impossibly tall. He looks down on you with faint sympathy in his eyes, but his otherwise unreadable expression. I'm going to tell you three things, he says in a slow, careful voice. If I tell them to you, and they come true, will you believe me? Where'd you come from, you ask blarely. He shakes his head. The question is, where have you gone? Is there something bad here? Well, you know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Say, like if someone burns toast. A lot of things happen right here in this particular hotel over the years. And not all of them was good. What? He holds up a hand. Better to listen than to talk. The first thing I'll tell you is, my dog's got no nose. Dog, no nose. The second thing is, the party is BYOJ. Party? The third thing is... Only one who seeks will find. <laughs> what do these things mean? That's all I'm permitted to say. Give me your ring. I'll return it to you when you find these things to be true. He bends down and gently slips the wedding ring from your ref left hand. He sings kindly of trouble. You like ice cream, Doc? He asks. I thought you did. Yeah, I thought you did. Get something cold on that skull of yours. You're gonna have a nasty lump. The image of the giant fades away into the nothingness, the bright light fading with him, leaving you in darkness. Stag your feet and fumble for a light switch. You find yourself in your hotel room, though you can't be sure how you know it's yours. You leave and slowly make your way down the lobby until you exit the front door and pack a handful of snow against your head, wincing. What the hell's going on in this place? As you turn to re-enter the hotel, a sudden gust of wind blows the snow all around you, turning everything white. 
You stumble forward, waving your hand in front of you, and enter a round, prickly wall of a hedge. The wind dies down. You're in a narrow green corridor. A hedge maze? Oh, terrific. What kind of weird hotel is a hedge maze anyway? You start to shiver and realize you'd better find your way back to the hotel before you freeze to death. So yeah, um, the Overlook Hotel is the hotel in The Shining. The Great Northern is uh, the hotel in Twin Peaks that the main character Cooper stays at. And the Lodge is a interdimensional important place in Twin Peaks. This scene is a reference to the giant scene from episode one of season two of Twin Peaks, which I believe I watched last night. Um, a fun note, the giant in that scene is played by Lurch from the Adams Family Values. It's the same actor, mostly because he's so damn big. All right, you're finding an elephant meat cart, topiary animal. This topiary animal is definitely made by someone with limited topiary skill and experience. Remember, kids, make sure your arboreal artist is guild licensed and bonded. Otherwise, you could end up with something that looks like an elephant in a meat car had one night stand. <laughs> whoa. For, whoa. Holy moly. All right. You're fighting a spider duck topiary animal? Whoever that did the topiary animals for Twin Peak must have been drunk or on hallucinogens or both. This looks like the top half of a duck and the bottom half of a spider. Only the duck has mandibles and the spider's legs are webbed and... I don't know, man. It spins a web and then uses it as a slingshot to launch an egg as your ang at your ankle. Oh, boy. Rusty heads trimmers. That's probably a two-handed weapon, right? No. Am I blind? Recent items. It's a miscellaneous. Whoa. You force open the hedge trimmers against the layers of rust and frost and hack your way through the wall of the hedge. Damn shame to ruin the greenery, not to mention the shame you feel at subverting a good puzzle, but the needs must but the needs must when the devil drives. Teeth chattering, you struggle against the weight of a snowdrift to force open the side door of the lodge and make it back inside. It's not what you call warm inside, but it's warmer. At least the sort of chills this place gives you aren't the sort where you have to worry about your toes falling off. <laughs> now your brain's defrosted enough to handle a coherent thought. You return to the question of what exactly is going on here. Barman said he'd been killed and that he, you knew who killed him, but you don't remember anything of the sort. What's more, he seemed to know you, and for that matter, you knew him, but you could swear you'd never been here before. Well, the agency sent you, to solve, sent you here to solve this mystery, so that's what you intend to do. Clap your hands and rub them together, partly from eagerness, and partly to rub the last remnant of the chill from your fingers. Wait, the agency? Let's search the pantry. Rows of fluorescent lights flicker on as you enter the kitchen and flip the switch, illuminating steel prep tables, sinks, ovens, rats of pots and knives, and the accoutrement of a kitchen engineered to handle several hundred guests during the busy season. You meander over to the pantry, unlock the latch, and pull open the heavy metal door. You aren't sure what you're looking for, but it stands to reason that if you don't know any, if you don't know what it is, then you also don't know where you're most likely to find it. So the hotel pantry is as good a place to look as any. Stepping aside, you're greeted by the sight of row upon row of shelves, stacked with boxes and cans and jars of every per imperishable food imaginable. If there even is a needle in this haystack to begin with, you've got quite a search ahead of you. Ooh. Your familiar gnaws distracted a carton of dog biscuit biscuits as you walk up and down the aisles looking at the packages, pushing them aside to check behind them, crouching to look under the shelves. Nothing. With a sigh, you start down the canned goods aisle. Doesn't look like you're going to find anything, but no leads anyway, so you might as well be thorough. Canned fruit, canned vegetables, canned fish, canned meat, cream corn, cream corn, cream corn, cream corn. There's a lot of cream corn here, actually. <laughs> you pick up one of the cans and give it a closer look. The brand name is Garmon Bosia which you've never heard of before. I believe that's another Twin Peaks reference. I think it's what spiritual energy is called. Is that Italian for something? Italian for cream corn, mainly? Maybe. You grimace at the slightly faded photograph of yellow mush, and then, as you notice, the ingredients list begins with pain and suffering. You hear a loud clunk behind you. Is that the door? You run, to the ba you run back to the front of the room, reaching in time to hear the bolt and latch being slid into place and locked. There's no handle on this side. You push futilely on the cold metal slab and start pounding it with your fists. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? You shout. Open the door. Let me out of here. Open the door. There's no response, although you think you can hear someone moving around outside. You lean against the door, your forehead resting against the cold metal, trying to calm down. Listen, you call out. Let me out of here. I'll forget the whole thing. It'll be like nothing ever happened. No response. 
furious, you start pounding the door with your fists again and then slamming it into your shoulder. It doesn't budge. After several hours, you wear yourself out. You have a frustrating, unsatisfying meal consisting of a bag of Oreos and an economy-sized jar of peanut butter and end up falling asleep on some large sacks of salt. I don't know. That's a pretty satisfying meal. Just Oreos and peanut butter? Hell yeah, bro. Sometime later, you're woken by the chattering of teeth. You're lying on a snowdrift back in the hedge mage. You aren't sure if that's preferable to being locked in the pantry or not. You're fighting for some mismatched twins. <laughs> in a clearing of the hedge maids, you see a giant muscle-bound man dancing with a midget who only comes up to his knees. Oh, thank goodness, you say. I'm so sick of twins. What are you talking about? The giant says in a heavy Austrian accent. We are identical twins. The midget nods. Swed near the end of the so this is so this little guy is a so this is the giant and the the dwarf from Twin Peaks, but it's also the movie Twins where Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito are twin brothers, uh, and then this is just because the dwarf speaks like has weird backwards talk, like in in Twin Peaks, uh, how it works is they say something backwards and then they play the audio clip backwards. Are you sure? Because you're tiny. You're huge and he's tiny and oh great, you say, as their identical scowls cloud their faces. And two tiny fists and two huge fists are clenched. The giant hurls the midget at you. He lands in your shoulders and yanks your ears until they almost come off. We get an art artisanal Le Mans solo. Uh, I hear my wife shouting at my cat in the distance, so I'm going to go check on them to make sure everything is okay. But also, this is a pretty good place to stop this episode anyway. I've been Alfred. This has been a Twin Peaks reference and Kingdom of Loathing. Go play it yourself. Love you. Uh, remember to take care of yourself and stuff. Bye. I've been Alfred. Alfred. <laughs>